Saban, welcome to the Hack Your Life podcast. Yeah, good to be here, brother. Good to be here. Let's do it. Man, excited to have you. Um, so I actually went up to Maine for the first time with my wife a couple years ago. Nice. And bro, underrated state. Don't tell anyone. Don't tell <laughs> anyone to go. Where'd you go? We went, so we stopped up. Um, uh, we went to Acadia, but on our way back, we stopped in Portland. And yeah. I told Beck, I'm like, this is one of the coolest cities. And I feel like it doesn't have that uh, that buzz. So we just went to Nashville this week. Obviously, Nashville has the buzz. Yeah. Austin has the buzz. Yeah. Um, but man, Portland's a cool city. It's catching on. You know, the secret's out. People have definitely caught on to it. And uh, it's, you know, per capita, a top restaurant city in the country per capita. The food is bonkers. Amazing chefs, coffee shops bars, pubs, you know, right on the water, cobblestone streets. It's so charming. It's, you know, for people who don't know, it is, it is really, really remarkable. Yeah. It's for sure worth the trip. Um, so you were originally from that area, correct? Right outside. Yeah. Of I'm from a, a suburb adjoining, uh, right next to, uh, Portland. It's called Scarborough. It's a small little town. Um, you know, right on the border of, uh, of, uh, Portland. I'm from like a little kind of beach community within there. And, you know, grew up there with my mom my whole life until I went to college. I went to college in New York City and I've ended up here in Los Angeles, but I, I still go home to Maine all the time. Our house is there and, you know, family, friends, you know, all my, all my buddies that I want to go home and the guys that make fun of you and you just drink with, <laughs> you know, it's, it's your home. So yeah, Maine's that's awesome. Home. Yeah, I love it. So when was it, you know, you first had the idea to start a food truck was it something to where you wanted to start a food truck and then you thought of you know lobster or was it you know lobster was something that you enjoyed I'm sure being up in Maine and then thought about the food truck how did that how did that look like yeah you know what it really uh it really was just that I was we were out to dinner with my I was out to dinner with my cousin Jim who uh you know I did I did the business with and he's he's the the youngest of the family we have a bunch of girls in between all cousins and you know and then there's me I'm the oldest one and um you know, he came out, I hadn't seen him in years, you know, family kind of, you go in, he's college and this and that. And, and we were out drinking and uh, we were talking about family and this and that and our upbringing and uh, our jobs. And the more we talk, the more, you know, you kind of get emotional and sentimental about your childhood. You realize how good things are, you know, you're older. Um, and we're like, God, and again, the more you drink, you're like, we should work together. You know, we should do something, man. You know that we should do something, that kind of thing. Right. Um, and the more you drink, the better it sounds. So, so we're, we're, we're having fun. And then we're like, man, you know, what about lobster? Right. Cause it just came to your point, just pops in your head, you know, cause that's really all we, one of the staples of things we knew. Uh, I imagine, I always say, if I grew up um, in the South, maybe it would have been barbecue. I grew up in Maryland, maybe it would have been those crabs, maybe it was, you know, LA or San Diego's tacos, but for us, it, it was lobster. And I'm like, lobster, yeah, okay, well, then what would we do? You know, like lobster rolls, you know, yeah, you know, get it all out, okay. And, um, and then we, you know, we bat around the idea of restaurant or food truck, and restaurants were so expensive and risky and scary. Um, we went with a food truck because we were just basically like, well, the hell with it, it doesn't work, it doesn't work you know, and we weren't really doing it to make money. We were just kind of doing it to like do something entrepreneurial and creative, uh, kind of like what it sounds like what you're doing. We had, you know, just trying to dabble here and try this and do this and hopefully this and you learn um, and maybe it pops and it did. So what did that look like? So you guys both had jobs then and you kind of did it on the weekends. Did you buy yeah. a truck from the jump? Yeah. Full-time jobs. I sold real estate, uh, managed about like 15 real estate agents underneath me. And I was really, really successful. Great, great job. Uh, Jim was a medical, sold medical devices for a company named Striker Orthopedics. Big job, but a great job. Both really, you know, good thing. Um, we worked on this idea for a year. We didn't tell anybody. Um, and I mean, nobody. Uh, we didn't want any pessimism. We didn't want any negativity. We didn't want anyone going, eh, you know, because a lot of that stuff will, will uh, dissuade you really quickly. Uh, about a week before we opened, uh, uh, we bought a used truck, a used food truck for 65000 you know, put our logo and our thing up, which we thought was good. We had no idea. Um, and we told our friends and family about a week before we opened, they all thought we were crazy. Like, well, what do you know about food? What is, you know, what lobster for what, you know? Yeah. And we didn't, we had, we were 
making the trial run practice in my, in my one bedroom apartment in West Hollywood, you know, he was sleeping on an air mattress and we're like, okay, let's figure it out. Let's see how this goes. That was it. We showed up the first day. We didn't have a register. We didn't know how to do anything. <laughs> um, and we just went with it and we opened the window and there was probably 60, 70 people in line. Wow. One of the people in line was a, a, a producer from Shark Tank who asked us to go on the show that very night. Two months later, we were on the show and, you know, the rest is history. But we were uh, we were very busy from the beginning. I went home that night. We made like six or seven grand, put it on my coffee table. I'll never forget. And we're sitting there. We're exhausted. Right. We both have to work in the morning, our regular jobs. We have this other business, which apparently is going to be really busy. I'm looking at six grand. I don't even know what the hell to do with it. And we knew it was going to be really big. And the next day was seven grand. The next day was four grand. Right? You know, first month we made like 65,000. The next month we made like 90,000, a hundred thousand a month. Um, right off the start, very busy while managing our jobs. And it was just, it was crazy. That's incredible. So then what did your full-time job look like? So were you doing that exclusively on the weekends? Were you working Monday through Friday, all day, every day, and then just doing it on I was the working seven days a week, both jobs. Wow. You know, so both jobs, my wow. real estate job is not an office job, right? So it allowed right. me flexibility, but it was still, my, you know, at one point I had like 60 listings. I sold houses, you know, so, you know, at that point I, I wasn't that busy, but I was very busy and just figuring it out. You know, I did that for six months. We, we kept our jobs for about six months because it's scary, you know, quitting what you do, your professional career. Cause now this is my profession. I'm, you know, I've done this for nine years, but before that I, you know, I was like, I don't want to give up what I do for, you know, I don't know, what is this, one trough food truck? Yeah. Um, so we did that for six months, worked our ass off, and then finally, you know, went all in. Wow. And then so, I mean, for anybody listening, because I, I know of at least three people that this is their dream, right? This is their dream to start a, a food truck um, and see oh. that food truck thrive. Logistically speaking, for anybody you know wanting to do this down the road, I don't think this is an industry, as I'm sure you know, is never going to die, or at least anytime in the near future. Um, so can you maybe walk through the logistics? I mean, even somebody who doesn't want to do this, I think it's fascinating to hear what did it look like getting permits? You know what I mean? In LA County, what were the finances like with getting those permits? Mm -hmm. uh, to, well, you first said something. I don't think it's going anywhere. I don't think, right. you know, it's in COVID proved uh, that this is an, this is a very accessible, good thing um, yeah. uh, with or without COVID we've done well, but food trucks aren't going anywhere. Most big brands like Chick-fil-A, uh, in and out Cinnabon, they're all pivoting and grabbing a lot of food trucks. Uh, yeah. So that's that. In regards to, um, you know, you can buy different tiers of quality of trucks. They're shells. They're essentially shells like UPS trucks. They're box trucks. So you could buy one for 20 grand, 50 grand, 60 grand, 80 grand, all better quality as you go up. You can upfit them, meaning put in Average material, good material, great material, superior material, depending on what it is. So all in, our first truck was $65,000, all in. That's like a loan from the bank for you to buy a car, right? So yeah. for you, you know, if you bought a $65,000 car, which is a nice car, it's not the top of the line car, but that's a nice car for 65 grand. Your payments are what? I don't know, a thousand a month, 800 a month, I don't know, you know, 1200. That's your responsibility. Now, should the business go bad? You can always sell it. So the risk is kind of lower. Right. Um, uh, you know, our trucks in comparison now, we pay about 220,000 for our trucks. So we, you know, we buy, we buy really nice and we, you know, um, the lower you buy, the more trouble you'll have with it, but it's a little better barrier to entry. Um, you, you can buy ones that are already upfitted and built out and then you adapt to it. So let's say you want to do a, a grilled cheese truck or you want to do a taco truck, or you want to do uh, a Greek truck, you know, your interior ideally would have a layout that will complement your menu and what you're cooking. You don't need a bunch of fryers if you're not frying food or a bunch of freezers if you don't have frozen food, but inevitably you can just get something and work with it, uh, get in for cheap um, and start and see how it goes. Uh, my, my one caution with that is sometimes people uh, they don't want to spend any money. So they're so, because they're scared and their business doesn't really work because they're being cheap. You can't be cheap when you're going into business 
than when you're trying to make your business succeed. You can have budgets. You can say, I can't spend this much than this, but you can't be cheap. So a lot, sometimes we meet people and, they go, and they're struggling. And I look at them and their idea is great. And everything's, and you're like, well, what's going on? And you peel back and they just don't want to spend money when they have to. For us, we bought the best, the best premium lobster when we opened. That was the one thing we never deviated on. Um, we didn't know about this. We didn't know if we should spend money on Facebook or marketing or PR or this or t-shirts or the, all this shit that you can spend money on. But we knew that when we bought the lobster, because we were offered this, the, the B or the C or the B plus or the A minus, we said A plus only and we'll pay for it. So if your listeners are listening, it's easy to get into this business, um, but whatever your business is within it, you have to be the best. You have to, you have to put the best quality out. Yeah, I agree. And I agree 100% with you. Uh, I was even just looking at a, a mall the other day and it's like, you know, you can imagine having a contract with the mall and then you can obviously see what's happening to malls, but it's like, you look at the future and the future is mobile. I mean, everybody's everywhere. And obviously there's a huge, huge advantage to be able to be in, you know, uh, this pier one day and then downtown the next day. So can you maybe just talk about the advantages you've seen personally with having a food truck? I mean, we have both, right? So I can tell you advantages of both, but yeah. when it comes to um, the food truck itself, I mean, you hit it on the head. You said that we're, we're mobile nowadays, right? And not right. only are we mobile, but like we, we like things in a different form. Like last night I got Thai food delivered on Grubhub. I didn't go to a restaurant. I didn't right. wait in line and do anything. I was putting my son to sleep. And when I got out, there was, there was Thai food at my front door. <laughs> Genius. Thank you. You know, so we like things that we don't have to always go commit to and park at and sit at. That's like, I'm like, it, we like things easy. Yeah. Um, we also like celebratory feel good things. Feel food trucks are celebratory and feel good. So when you go, you kind of, Oh, this, Oh, you want to get this? I'm going to go walk and get that one right there. I'm going to get the, you know, I'm in the mood for, it's pretty, oh, you're going to get lobster? Cool. You know, boom, no big deal. It's fun. Um, but if, from an economical standpoint, just like you said, today I could be in Venice Beach for lunch and I could be doing really, really well in Venice Beach. And tonight I could go to Beverly Hills. Tomorrow I could go do a, a high school function in Burbank. Um, and the next day I could go here. I could go to, uh, we have a truck in Columbus, Ohio. Okay, so they can go do, um, uh, they used to do the, the Buckeye games, you know, which is amazing. Your restaurant can't go do a Buckeye game. They can't go do a tailgate. Right. right. Um, but we can. And there you are tailgating and you can have a lobster. That's pretty cool. And then we go away and now we go downtown. So it's just the accessibility and the, the, there's no rent. Your yeah. rent is your payment. Correct. You know, so there's no fixed rent. You don't have to drive traffic to a single destination you just can tell people where you're going to be ideally in high traffic areas right so are there any are, i guess are there any advantages to having a brick and mortar so i mean if you're somebody who's looking to start and wants to get in you know the food business is there you know a person that might be listening that shouldn't go the food truck route but should you know instead go to the brick and mortar route well brick and mortar is easier Brick and mortar is not as challenging. There are not as many logistics. Uh, there is not as many wear and tear, breakdowns, things that can go wrong. I think it's easier to keep staff um, because staff, you know, they just have to go from point A to point B, the same location every day. It's usually easier. Um, in our instance, I have someone driving today to Venice and driving to Burbank at night and driving all, you know, it's, it's kind of a pain. It's hard, uh, you know, wear and tear, breakdowns, the logistics for me to coordinate, like I just said, in order, we don't just, you can't just show up in Venice. You have to have a permit, like you right. said. Um, and it might not even be a thing, but it's still a pain. I have to go through that process. I have to email someone and guarantee where my spot is. And then I have to be out by this. And that takes time. My brick and mortar is open, open, closed. Yeah. You know, it's there. Um, so there's, I'd say overall, in my opinion, it's an easier job to run assuming you have volume, assuming right, that you right. have people that come. If you have a crappy location, it doesn't matter if the rent's free right. because um, you know it's very hard to staff when people aren't doing anything. So it's a kind of a catch 22, but I guess the advantages to me, I think are, I just think it's an easier business to run assuming you get the volume. 
Yeah, without question. Yeah, there's pros and cons to both. That's interesting for me. There's, to but there's more. There's more risk because most landlords will make you sign a five year or ten year lease. True. True. So. That's a great point. Do you see a future, you know, in the food industry that looks different, or specifically with food trucks? I mean, do you see any variations in the food truck industry? Um, then to what we're currently doing? Yeah, with you know maybe the fairs or any any like I said anything. I, I just think I just think you're just going to see a lot more. Yeah. I think I think bigger brands are already adapting to yep. do it. Yeah. Um, whereas you, there were only a couple. I think you know you're going to see big brands with it as opposed to ones who probably we didn't before a lot of big brands and big restaurant chains kind of poo-pooed it and they didn't love it it was almost like hey you're taking away from us you're taking there was a notion like you're taking business away from us when when we're really all in the same business the food right. business where now it's we we like our brick and mortar on the corner of a and b street but we also like driving and doing caterings at here and doing these things so i just think you're going to see a lot more of it um I think you're going to continue to see really, really excellent quality. And I think the quality will only go up as the more competition comes in, there's more and competition is good. It makes for the best. Yeah. So I think, I think there's some really, really good chefs out there with great ideas. Um, I think you're going to see more of it and uh, probably some more regulations and probably things will open up. When I started this nine years ago, we were worried that this was a fad. We were kind of like, man, I don't know, is it going to last? Or are the regulations going to clamp us down? Are the restaurants going to clamp us? I think regulations are opening and they're encouraging it because it's commerce. It's still money. It's still taxes. It's still, you know, I'm providing jobs. I'm making money. I'm paying the city to be here. And people are happy. It's just yeah. fun. Yeah. You know, so I think, I think you're just going to see a lot more of it and a lot more uh, positive aspects of it. Yeah. So we kind of talked about how brick and mortar um and at least some sense is, is here to stay. You know what I mean? Like, like I talked about malls, but in general, that's here to stay. Obviously food trucks here to stay. Anybody getting started? Is there any trends that you see right now um, that you think people should stay clear of? Steer clear of? In regards to the food or, industry? Well, you know, I don't want to sound the, you know, I don't want to crush anyone's dreams or to be negative. And I'm certainly not an expert in, in restaurant space, but if it was me, I would just be scared of big spaces and big leases yeah. Yeah. and big long dining rooms filled with square footage. I really like, and this is a personal preference. I like small, quaint, grab and go, quick serve, small menus, yeah. I think that they work really well. I think they're good from an inventory standpoint, from an right. owner. Yep. Um, I think they're easy to monitor for a person. like I didn't go to business school. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, right? But I can handle this. Right? If I had 50 different views and this and that and waiters in front and back and this and that, like, I don't know that I could do that. It's hard. Yeah. You know, so um, I, don't, I don't know that some people, you know, I'm not to say that some people, people are great at it, but if it was me, uh, I would stay away from the big right. um, and focus on what I'm really good at. And what I'm good at, I'm the best at lobster rolls. That's what we're best at. Um, and I and I still think we're the, also the best at service and customer service and care and stuff like that. And providing a really nice experience for someone in a fast, casual setting. If you go to In-N-Out, their customer service is flawless. Yeah. And they do a number one, a number two, and a number three. Oh, shit, that's great. <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't for anything else yeah um so i i would steer clear of things personally that are too complicated and big especially yeah. from a startup perspective for people that are like start it's scary you know i think sometimes we as entrepreneurs bite off more than we can chew it's our ego um and, or we just can't settle on anything we think everything is such a good idea um Barbara taught from Shark Tank, one of the early things she taught us, she's like, not every idea is a good idea. Um, and sometimes when you have a taste of success, your brain and your ego think you're really smart. So we thought we were doing really, really well when we first started. Like, Wait, we should do this. She's like, no, 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 no. And the minute she told us, no, we still did it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when you're good at something, stick to it. If that's cheesesteaks, damn, man, perfect the cheesesteak and do it. If it's coffee, perfect it. I come for coffee. Maybe I want a scone. Probably, you know, maybe, it, but you don't need to get in a scone. 
right? You're in the coffee business. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, let's focus on being the best coffee. And uh, so I would, my, my thing is people get their brains crazy and that sometimes comes with big. I like small. Yeah. No, that, that's always mobile. Life. It's also adaptable, right? right? You can scale yeah. it quicker. So if you do have one food truck that works, then you can get two or one small brick and mortar, then you can get two, but big, it's harder to double and triple. And that's where you're going to make more money. Yeah, no, that's valuable. That's really valuable. Last thing, Sabin. So you talked about, you know, starting this with your cousin. Um, what's the number one piece of advice you would give to somebody looking to, to start something up? Maybe, like I said, it's in the finance world, or maybe it's like you were in the real estate game or the coffee game, whatever it is, what's some advice you would give to somebody just now starting? Regardless of if they have a partner or a family partner or something. Correct. Yeah. Just, yep. in, just general. in general. Yep. Um, no. Well, it's, I touched on it just now. You need to be the best at what you do. Yeah. Number one, um, your product, whatever the product must be, must be a 10. I really believe that um, in order to be successful. I really, really do. Um, random example, just because I'm, it just popped in my head. There's a place two blocks from me that does like egg, egg sandwiches, like English muffin egg sandwiches. And I drove by it and I said, what the hell is that small little place? And uh, I tried it and it was just average and I'm never going to go back. Yeah. If it was very good, I yep. would have probably been there 12 times by now. Yeah. And I can't yep. be the only person. So all they had to do was, I mean, how's egg sandwich? How, I don't know, make 50 of them. You'll come up with a good one. Wow. Don't be cheap. So, so, and I'm not the only guy that eats like that or, or person. I eat out all the time, right? Whatever it is, be the best. Number one. Number two, don't be cheap. It doesn't mean be reckless, but do not be cheap. Um, I think you always have to think like the, a consumer. I think you have to be kind. When I go places and people don't say thank you to me, they don't appreciate my business. They're not kind to me. They don't look me in the eye. They don't say, sir, ma'am. They call me bro, dude, this, that, and the other. I don't go back. Yeah. Um, and I might be an old school kind of guy like that, but I don't like that. I like it when people say they kind to me. So if you have a really good product and you're appreciative and kind, it, it's you. I, I think you're going to say, I certainly would bet on you more than if you're cheap cutting corners in your right. route, right? I mean, that's obvious. Right. So if you're thinking of starting something, whatever it may be, are you able to commit to those kind of fundamentals? Or are you just looking for a fast, quick buck and looking to have an a, a income generating that you can sit home and be on the couch? If right. you're looking for something quick and easy, don't get into a small business because it's not quick it's not easy and it's it, you know it, it takes a long time before you make some money like that yeah so That's if you're doing it for the right reasons you know you will succeed so i'd say those are probably the top tiers and do something that um do something that you're passionate about. That's kind of a cliche, but you know, if you're not passionate, if you do something for money, if you make decisions centered around money, you're not going to make it. Right. No, that's so true. Come. Yeah. The money is. comes when you put it aside and you focus on actually what the end is. Yeah. If the end is the best cup of coffee in the world with a cool branding, then, then the money will come. But if you start going, if I buy the cheap beans, but I charge $4 a cup, You'll make more in, in the beginning and then you'll, you'll fizzle out. Wow. That's great. No, honestly, that's great. And like you said, it's fundamentals, but I think sometimes we can get so excited with, you know, thoughts or even I'll be completely transparent on here. Um, you know, maybe with different things with kinds or different variations. And just because we have an idea doesn't always mean it's the right idea. And then pretty soon, like you said, we have way too much inventory you're so down the line you're now you're seven layers down the line when really the first couple ones were the right ones and right it, and it's entrepreneurial it's good you should it's good to be like that but you have to be the best at the first core first That's it. i yeah. mean you have to this you have to stamp this before you go to that yeah um in my opinion and i just think like it's human nature especially as entrepreneurs don't want to bite off more and to look for this next shiny carrot we all do it um, yeah. but if you're interested in starting a small business uh, good you should the other thing what are we rushed on time not at all no not so at all here's a here's a message to, to people um is to be fearless fear is an incredible source of like a way to stay in your lane you're you stay in a lane 
whole life, right? You're told you have to do this. You have to grow up. You have to go. You have to go to You have to do that. You, you know, stay in your lane. Usually when you say someone, you're going to do something crazy, they go, oh, huh, huh. you can't, especially your parents, you know, you stay in your lane. If I told you I was going to quit my job and open a food truck selling lobster, it doesn't sound like that great of an idea. And a lot of ideas are just that. They just, you know, how many times are you drinking or you're hanging out? You're this, uh, that. And you just have an idea. You go, I have an idea. Nah. <laughs> nah. And then you see someone do it. You see exactly. your idea come to fruition yeah. and you go, oh my God, I had, I was going to do that. Shit, that was mine. <laughs> how did he know? You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Good for the person who did it. Shame on you. Right. We've had people come up to us, especially in our early years. I was like, I was going to do this. I was going to do this. I'm, like, I'm sure you were. It's not rocket science that you did it. You know, we, that doesn't mean they'd work as hard as me or that they would have paid for the lobster. They're not from Maine. It doesn't mean they're going to work. You know, it doesn't mean they're me, but still they probably had the idea. Ideas are, you have to do it. So being fearless is important nowadays. Being fearless is you don't want to look back and go, I had that. I was going to do that. I could have done that. I'm going to say I did it. I gave it 100%. I bought the best disc. I tried my hardest. That I was ethical and it worked or it You know what I mean? Yeah. So small business people, you know, be fearless and believe in yourself. A lot of people don't tell you that enough nowadays. And I'm here to tell you the best decisions we've made are when we were fearless. The worst decisions we made were when we were scared. When you're scared and you're timid, it's like it's like playing sports. What sport do you, you like? Baseball. Imagine you play baseball and you're standing up to bat like this and you're scared of the ball. You're like, ah, right? You think you're going to hit it, get a home run? You know, even if you make contact, taking a jump shot, you're scared. It's not going in. These guys step up, they take a jump shot with confidence. So if you're going to do, be confident and go. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just like telling people that because a lot, you don't hear that enough. You don't know. Well, you always do the opposite. Like you talked about, maybe, you know, you have that small business you've thought about for five years and then you mention it to a friend, you know what I mean? Or, you know, your parents and you get that, you know, it's almost like they don't take it seriously until it's serious. You know what I mean? Until, you know, it's a million dollar company or whatever it is. Um, it's I, I amazing feel like most people don't think influential we are, right? Yeah. So if I told you something, if you told me something, you go, Saban, I have this really good idea for this cappuccino with, uh, you know, gold nuggets on the top. And I was like, uh, I don't know. You know, people just like cappuccinos the way they are. Or gold sounds expensive. Right. You might go, you're right. Gold is expensive. That's probably, right. you're right. It was, you're right. And then you move on. When really that could be the most genius marketing idea, then you could have been the cappuccino gold guy. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Now the celebrities want it. Yeah. It's, it's you so know, who knows what my, who I am? Who gives a what I say? It's what right. you believe. Wow. Once you believe, once you start understanding that, you get the courage to actually believe in yourself. And once you get the courage, you got all the juice. Like we believe in ourselves now. We're on fire because no one's going to tell us something. We don't care what you think. Right. You know wow. what I mean? I like. I, I. We have all the. We have all the juice. You know what I mean? And you guys got to. What we? Every person has it. It's just a matter of how, how much or how little. Well, and also, generally speaking, the people that doubt it are the people that are miserable. You know what I mean? I've never heard anybody that's chased something, uh, whether it's failed or whether it's succeeded, and has talked down to a dream. Do you know what I mean? Because exactly. um, they see the value in it, and they see that there's potential. But the people that had dreams that's consistently died over the course of 40 years have no hope because they've seen no hope themselves. Exactly. And you're so. not them. You're not them. And they aren't you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're you. So listening, if you're listening and you're you, you're believe in yourself. Go do what the hell you want to do with your life. Yeah. Don't listen to anybody else. That's powerful. Hey, that's a closer right there. That's that's a mic cool. drop, my man. Right, Saban, I appreciate cool. you coming on today. My pleasure, man. Best of luck. Stay in touch if you need anything. Good luck.